In the last few videos, we covered the various ways we can pre-process our corpus. And while doing that may be enough to create a few simple rules-based systems, it's not enough if we want to work with machine learning or ML algorithms. To do that, we need to represent our text in a format which ML algorithms can work with. And we'll begin doing that here, starting with the simplest representation available, basic bag of words. The problem is this, after we pre-process our text, what we're left with are variable length sequences of symbols. From our demo using Spacey, for example, these could be doc or span objects. But most ML algorithms consume data as fixed length numeric vectors, like these examples here. So before we can leverage ML algorithms, we need to translate our pre-processed text into vectors. And that translation process is called vectorization. And for our purposes right now, a vector is simply an array or list of numbers. Before we explore how to do that, let's go over the classic ML pipeline. If you've looked at or worked in ML before, this probably looks familiar. It starts with us cleaning our corpus if necessary and running it through pre-processing. After that, we want to pull useful features from our text and combine them if necessary. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Once we have our features, we go to the modeling process where we input our features and labels into an ML algorithm to have it learn from the data and create a model for us. We also select some evaluation metric to judge how well our model is doing. From there, we refine our model until we're happy with it. Finally, we deploy our model into production and start making predictions with it. We'll learn more about modeling later in the course. By the way, I call this pipeline classic because the pipeline in deep learning looks different, as we'll see when we discuss it. For now, let's focus on feature selection and extraction. Again, some of this may look familiar to you already if you've done ML in the past. A feature, put simply, is any property in our data that we think is useful for making our desired prediction or explaining some relationship. Let's say we have a collection of farming data showing the various conditions crops were grown in and the resulting yield. What we're interested in is taking this data and building a model which can take in a set of growing conditions and predict future crop yields. In this case, a few features we might take from the data are the amount of fertilizer used, the amount of water applied, and the amount of sunlight available. In NLP, features could be a document's word count, a document's age, the author ID, or some metadata. To clear up some terminology, when we pull features from a data set, it's called feature selection. But you may also come across a term called feature extraction, which is different. Feature extraction is combining features to create new ones or reducing the number of features through a technique called dimensionality reduction. Ultimately, we want to take these features and end up with a matrix. In NLP, each row of this matrix represents a document. In formal ML terms, each row would be called an instance or feature vector, and each column represents a feature. In this example, the first row represents a single document with four features. If you have 100 documents from which you pulled five features, your matrix would be 100 by 5. If this is in any way confusing, it will be clearer once we get to some examples. In classic ML, selecting good features is critical. The adage garbage in, garbage out applies. Going back to our farming example, a feature like the color of the farmer's hat is likely irrelevant and will yield poor results. This also means that having domain knowledge is often an advantage. Even today, creative and high signal features with an ordinary algorithm can often beat mediocre features with the state-of-the-art algorithm. And since most day-to-day -day models are well understood and implemented, feature engineering is often the bulk of the work in classic ML. All right, so that's feature selection and extraction. With regards to NLP in particular, we want features which encode the semantics or meaning of a document, and ideally features which capture linguistic properties of the text. And there are a variety of ways to do this. Some of them merely capture the presence of a word. Some of them capture relative frequencies of words, and yet other methods are capable of encoding some meaning of the words themselves. One simple but effective approach is bag of words, which is a general technique to describe documents by word presence. The primary idea is that meaning and similarity are encoded in vocabulary. So for example, articles with pizza recipes probably share a lot of the same vocabulary like flour, tomatoes, yeast, and so on, but they won't have as much vocabulary in common with articles about jet engines, for example. So if two documents have a lot of overlapping vocabulary, then they likely belong to the same class. And that's the idea. It's called a bag because the order of the words in the document is discarded. We care only whether a word occurred, and maybe how frequently. For now, we'll just focus on whether a word occurred. When we encode text as a binary bag of words, what we end up with is a feature matrix that looks something like this. Each row represents a document, which could be a tweet or an entire book, 
and the number of rows we have is equal to the number of documents in our corpus. Each column represents a word in our vocabulary. So if we have 100 words or tokens in our corpus, we would have 100 columns. A setup like this where each row represents a document and each column represents a term is called a document term matrix. Elsewhere, you may come across examples where this matrix is transposed into a term document matrix, but this is the convention we'll stick with. From there, we'll mark a cell with a 1 if a word occurs in a particular document, and 0 if it does not. We're calling this a binary bag of words because, in this case, we don't care how many times a word occurs in a particular document. Whether it occurred once or 100 times, we mark it simply with 1. If we were doing a raw frequency bag of words, however, we would mark it with the number of times the word occurred. Let's elaborate with an example. Say we have these four documents and we want to encode them as binary bags of words. The first step would be to build our vocabulary, that is, identify all the unique words in the corpus, which leads us to this collection of 20 words. They're sorted here for convenience and clarity, but that's not necessary. Next, we'll assign an incrementing index value to each word starting from zero. The word Aston is zero, the word bull is one, and so on. Now we have everything we need to encode our bag of words. So with the first sentence, we start with an array of zeros equal to the length of the vocabulary. Then we simply go through each word and mark the respective index value with a 1. So we look at the word red, see it has an index value of 6, and mark the index position in the feature vector with a 1. We do the same thing with the word bull. That word has an index value of 1, so we mark the respective position in the feature vector for the sentence. And we repeat this process for the entire sentence until it's fully encoded. And then we can do the same thing for the rest of the sentences. So hopefully that looks clear and straightforward. As stated earlier, we're doing a binary bag of words. If we were doing a frequency bag of words, then in the second sentence, the index position representing the token F1 would be marked with a 2 since it occurs twice. But as we shall see, there are better ways to encode frequency. For now, let's go back to the binary bag of words. So what have we accomplished? Well, we finally encoded our variable length text as fixed length numeric vectors, which is what we wanted. But more than that, we've shifted our thinking about text. We've gone from thinking about text as a sequence of symbols to points in a multidimensional space, specifically a space that encodes some meaning of the text. In this case, our bag of words assumes meaning is encoded in the presence of certain words. Each document or feature vector in our bag of words is now a point in this multidimensional space. And this is called a vector space model or VSM. By the way, this illustration on the left is three dimensional, but in practice, the number of dimensions is equal to the number of features, which is equal to the size of our vocabulary in this case. Now, this transition into a VSM is a big deal. If two documents have a similar vocabulary, then their vectors should be closer together in this space we can view how documents cluster or how they're distributed. This allows us to quantitatively measure document similarity. And document similarity is useful for a variety of applications from ranking to classification. So how do we measure similarity? For our purposes, the more two vectors share the same direction and magnitude, the more similar they are. So these two vectors here highlighted share greater similarity than these two vectors. To calculate the similarity, we need to revisit the dot product, which is the basis for most vector similarity metrics. If you remember this, that's great. If not, it's straightforward. To calculate the dot product of two equal length vectors A and B, you simply multiply their corresponding components and add the results together. So if we have these two vectors here, their dot product is 1 times 4 plus 2 times 5 plus 3 times 6, which is 32. That's it. Going back to our earlier graph, the dot product between the two similar vectors is 30, and larger magnitudes of course lead to larger products, while the dot product between the two dissimilar vectors is 0. So now we have a way to measure similarity, but we want to take an extra step. As we just saw, if we're using word frequencies, higher frequencies are going to lead to larger dot products, which means that longer documents will tend to be favored. So we take the additional step of normalizing using vector length. To get a vector's length, you simply square each component of the vector, add the results together, then take the square root of that. This is also known as the L2 or Euclidean norm. Normalizing by vector length leads us to dividing the dot product of the two vectors by the product of the length of the vectors, which is the same as the cosine of the angle between two vectors. 
We've now arrived at the most common similarity metric used in NLP, which is cosine similarity. Anytime we measure similarity between two vectors using this metric, we'll get a 1 if they're pointing in the same direction, and 0 if they're orthogonal. And the range of values will always be between 0 and 1 inclusive, because we won't have any negative frequencies. With that, let's measure the similarities between the documents we encoded earlier. So if we compare document 1 with each of the documents in term, we get these measures. And at a glance, this fits with what we're seeing. Documents 1 and 2 share the highest similarity, which fits with the multiple words they have in common. Documents 1 and 3 are less similar because they share fewer words in common, while documents 1 and 4 come up as dissimilar. Now, you might be wondering at what threshold value two documents should be considered similar. Should it be 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.6? There is no universal answer to this, and it comes down to your application and your data. It's important to note that this gives us only the surface similarity, that is, how much vocabulary overlap there is between two documents. Depending on your application, this may be good enough, but just keep in mind that you can have two sentences saying almost the same thing, as we do here with Dog Bites Man and Canine Nips Human, and it'll show zero cosine similarity. So that's how we encode text as a bag of words and compare them using a popular similarity metric. This can be a good place to start, but the binary or frequency bag of words approach has a number of drawbacks. As we just saw, it doesn't handle synonyms or tenses, let alone words which are close in meaning. So swim and swam will be considered completely different words, though that can be somewhat mitigated through lemmatization. Later on in the course, we'll look at encoding schemes which try to capture the meaning of words so that similar words are closer together in space. There's no way to handle out-of-vocabulary words. Let's say we encode our corpus as a bag of words, and we have a new document which we want to compare for similarity against our corpus. We'll need to encode this new document using the same vocabulary as our corpus. And if our new document contains words which aren't already in the vocabulary, those words are going to get dropped. Now, this can be somewhat mitigated through stemming, and depending on your application and your data, this may or may not be a problem. Next, bag of words creates sparse matrices where the majority of values are zero. This can be expensive to both store and compute, but can be mitigated using alternative data structures such as dictionaries. SciPy has a sparse matrix package which can store these representations efficiently. Finally, word order information is lost, which can be a problem. Chelsea beats Barcelona and Barcelona beats Chelsea mean different things, but these two sentences would have an identical bag of words encoding. This can be mitigated using something called n-grams, which is the last thing we'll cover before the demo. The concept of an n-gram is simple. It's just a chunk of continuous tokens. So far in our tokenization, we've created unigrams. A 2-gram or bigram would have two tokens per chunk. A 3-gram or trigram would have three tokens per chunk, and so on. So tokenizing Chelsea beats Barcelona into bigrams would result in this sequence. Chelsea beats and beats Barcelona. Sometimes at the beginning and end of sentences, some libraries might add padding as well. Similarly, Barcelona beats Chelsea results in these bigrams. Everything else we do with encoding and similarity remains the same. This way we've captured some context, which unigrams didn't. And the vocabulary in this case is the collection of bigrams across the corpus. Now in practice, you don't necessarily have to pick one or the other. If after some exploration and analysis, you find n-grams which add value, you can incorporate the meaningful ones, such as social media, Los Angeles, or witch hunt. A couple of ideas on how to identify them could be first filtering out stop words and finding the n-grams which occur frequently. Maybe you use part of speech tags to help you pick up only bigrams which are noun noun, for example, or which have been flagged as entities by your named entity tagger. Another idea is to use a measure of association, such as pointwise mutual information, to measure the probability of two words co-occurring versus occurring individually across a corpus. So that's what n-grams are, but we're still left with trouble handling out-of-vocabulary words, and with n-grams, dimensionality increases rapidly, which can be undesirable. With that, let's look at how to do this stuff. Alright, so here I've opened the NLP Demystified Vectorization Notebook. The link to it is on the module page. Alternatively, you can visit the course GitHub repo and open it from the notebook's directory. As we did in the pre-processing notebook, the first thing we want to do is upgrade Spacey and install the right statistical language package. I've already done so here, so if you need to, please pause the video and do so now. As with all notebooks in this course, this one is fully documented for you to explore. For now though, I suggest just following along with the code. All right, what we'll do first is look at how to create a plain frequency bag of words using the same corpus from the slides. Now that you know how basic bag of words representations are built, I'm confident you can do it from scratch using dictionaries and lists. 
Fortunately, there are robust libraries which make it easy. To build our bag of words, we're going to use the count vectorizer class from scikit-learn, which does exactly what we need. The count vectorizer takes a collection of documents and generates a vocabulary along with a matrix of token counts. To do this, we'll call the fit-transform method on our corpus. Fit-transform performs two steps, fit and transform. The fit step goes through our corpus and creates a vocabulary dictionary from it. Remember the example from the slides how we assigned index values to each unique word in our vocabulary? That's what this does. The transform step creates the bag of words matrix with the appropriate token counts for each document. Once that's done, we can look at the features, i.e. words or tokens, pulled from our corpus, and also look at the vocabulary dictionary. So here's our vocabulary or list of features. And below that are our mappings. As we covered in the slides, one of the drawbacks of bag of words is a sparse representation which can be expensive to process and store. Count Vectorizer tries to minimize that by returning compressed sparse row matrices. If we take a look at the actual object itself, rather than a 2D array, we get a list of tuples, where the first value represents the document, and the second value represents the token index. The column over represents the count. So in the second document, the token F1 occurs twice. So that's easy and convenient, but before we go further, notice a few things. The count vectorizer tokenized for us. It removed all punctuation and also lowercased the words. But what if we want to use our own tokenizer or the one from Spacey? Also, it returned word frequencies, but what if we want a binary bag of words? Let's check out how to do that further below. Count Vectorizer lets you supply your own tokenizer. You can provide that tokenizer as a callback function. And for each document, Count Vectorizer will call that function and expect a list of tokens in return. So here we have a function called Spacey Tokenizer, which takes some text, tokenizes it, and returns a list of tokens with the punctuation filtered out. We'll instantiate another Count Vectorizer, but this time pass it the Spacey Tokenizer function for tokenization, skip on lower casing, and also set binary to true. Setting binary to true will result in a binary bag of words. We'll then call fit transform on our corpus. If we look at the resulting feature names and vocabulary, we see they reflect what we asked for. So now we have a binary bag of words in the form of a sparse matrix structure. If we want to get a 2D matrix view of it, we can call its toArray method. The resulting matrix is the one we used as an example in the slides. We can also index and slice the sparse matrix, just like a regular list. All right, so next up, cosine similarity. Like a bag of words, now that you know the formula, it's easy to roll your own, but again, there are multiple ways to do it using libraries. SciPy includes a package called Spatial, which has algorithms and data structures for spatial calculations. Included there is a method to calculate cosine distance. To get cosine similarity from that, we subtract the distance from one as shown here. So if we calculate and print the similarity scores between document one and every other document, we get what we saw in the slides. Another approach is to use scikit-learn's pairwise cosine similarity. When we pass this method a single matrix, it'll calculate the cosine similarity of each document against every other document. So here we pass in our entire bag of word structure and we get this matrix with the rows and columns representing the documents. And finally, n-grams. Count vectorizer includes a way to generate n-grams using the n-gram range parameter. It takes a minimum and maximum. By default, it's set to 1, 1 to generate unigrams. If we want to generate both unigrams and bigrams, we can set it to 1, 2. Doing so here yields both unigrams and bigrams. And of course, that leads to a higher number of features. If we want to generate bigrams only, then we set the min and max of the n-gram range to 2, 2, and get a vocabulary of only bigrams. Okay, so that's how we can use Spacey and Scikit-Learn together to create basic bag of words representations of text and compare their similarities. There's a multi-step exercise here that takes you through tokenizing your text, vectorizing it, and then comparing a new document against the corpus. It's fairly short, and I encourage you to do it to get a feel for the tooling. In this video, we took our first step with symbol vectorization and described what it is and why it's needed. We then covered basic bag of words representations and how to compare documents with cosine similarity. We talked about n-grams and how to implement this and all the above with Python's data analysis ecosystem. 
We also discussed the trade-offs of these bag of words approaches, and depending on what you're trying to do, they may be a good starting point, particularly for small documents with few repeating elements. Ultimately though, they are quite limited. In the next video, we'll go beyond mere word presence and raw word counts and start encoding the relative importance of words in our vectors.